Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome to our re webinar. Uh, greetings, everybody. My name is Margaret Kimberly. I'm a coordinating committee member of Black Alliance for Peace. Thank you so much for joining us as we present our latest webinar, Full Spectrum Dominance, From AFRICOM to the Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, our virtual symposium about the connection between the expansion of the U.S. Africa Command, AFRICOM, and the growing U.S. military presence in the Asia Pacific region. The fact that you've joined us today is an indication that you are aware of the critical issues facing us all right now. We know that we cannot rely on corporate media, pundits, uh, or politicians in an election year to explain what's happening in the world, and in particular, how the United States role as a hegemon is creating conflict all over the world. Today, we have a panel of distinguished thinkers, authors, academics, and activists to help us all understand what it means for the United States to claim a right to divide up the world into various areas of influence and claim a right to deny sovereignty to the rest of the world. Uh, we also look forward to hearing from you. You can see there's a Q&A on your screen and there will be uh, a, a time where we can all interact and hear from you. Uh, first, we are going to start with the uh, U.S. Out of Africa Network Coordinator, Tunde Osazwa. And he will give us an update about the U.S. Out of Africa Network since our last webinar. Thanks, Margaret. Um, greetings, everyone. Uh, like Margaret, my name is Tunde Osazua, and I'm the of the U.S. Out of Africa Network, uh, and has over 250 member individuals and organizations from South, Central, and North America, Europe, and the African continent dedicated to ending the U.S. occupation of Africa and shutting down AFRICOM. The purpose of AFRICOM is to use U.S. military power to impose U.S. control of African land, forces, and labor and all of that to service the needs of the U.S. multinational corporations and the wealthy in the United States. It protects U.S. neocolonial interests in geopolitical competition with China and others. Since the last webinar uh, that we held on, uh, on AFRICOM on Soweto Day, June 16th, the U.S. OAN has had a membership meeting. Uh, we've moved to consolidate a coordinating committee um, we've begun to work with the Overseas Bases Realignment and Closure Coalition, a coalition that's skilled at engaging with political leaders, and we've expanded our connections with organizations on the African continent to make sure that we're working towards self-determination for all African people facing the full weight of AFRICOM on the continent. Um, so we have an International Day of Action scheduled for October 1st. Uh, which is the anniversary of AFRICOM's founding in 2008. Uh, and it, it's also two years since the U.S. Out of Africa Shut Down AFRICOM campaign was launched to agitate towards achieving the following demands of the campaign. Uh, those demands being the complete withdrawal of U.S. forces from Africa, the demilitarization of the African continent, the closure of U.S. bases around the world, and also, we're, we're demanding that the Congressional Black Caucus uh, oppose AFRICOM and conduct hearings on the impact of AFRICOM on the continent. Uh, through this day of action, we aim to raise the public's awareness about the U.S. military's existence in Africa, as well as the violence and instability exacerbated wherever U.S. forces find themselves in Africa. The Black Lives for Peace has taken up the task of educating the public on AFRICOM and the extensive basing networks in Africa and throughout the world. Our campaign on AFRICOM is an integral element of our general opposition to U.S. global militarization with its offensive command structures um, between 800 and 1,000 overseas bases and the, US, uh, the United States' status as the number one arms merchant on the planet. 
We're calling on our friends and allies, you all uh, around the world, to join us in calling for the United States to respect the wishes of African people, militarize the African continent so Africa can begin to be a zone of peace. We say the brutality, violence, and systematic degradation of Black life in the colonized zones of the United States against Black people by the domestic police is replicated in Africa by the U.S. global police represented by the Pentagon and U.S. intelligence agencies. The African people who find themselves on the receiving end of the violence because of corrupted African leadership and are saying to the people in the United States, demand U.S. troops and U.S. money is withdrawn. It's clear uh, that the introduction of AFRICOM has resulted in less security, less democracy, and diminished human rights for African people who are in conflict with their own neocolonial government. Uh, so BAP supports that call, as, along with the U.S. Out of Africa Network, um, and uh, we're, we're calling on you know our friends and, and allies to endorse this day as an individual or an organization. And beyond that, we call on you all to organize uh, an educational event on October 1st, 2020, for which we provided materials on uh, our website. Uh, there's a page dedicated to this uh, day of action, and you can find more materials there. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, that that's that's my update on the U.S. Out of Africa Network. Uh, you can join our efforts by signing up for the USOAN at blacklinesforpeace.com uh, slash join U.S. Out of Africa Network, or you can contact me directly via email at USOAN at blacklinesforpeace.com. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing from the rest of our uh, panelists. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Tunde. Uh, I, we will now get started. Um, our very, I would ask our panelists, remind them all that uh, to be mindful of interpretation and uh, don't speak too fast. That's basically it. Our first speaker is, uh, is Baman Azad. Uh, Baman Azad is an Iranian American peace activist who's been involved in the struggle for peace and justice since the 70s. He's executive secretary of the U.S. Peace Council, a representative of the World Peace Council at the United Nations, and a member of the Administrative Committee of the United National Anti-War Coalition. He also plays leadership roles with the Coalition Against U.S. Foreign Military Bases, the Hands Off Syria Coalition, and he is chair of the Iran Working Group uh, at Veterans for Peace. Bahman Azad. Thank you, Margaret. Greetings, comrades and friends. Before I start, allow me to thank uh, Black Alliance for Peace for giving me the honor of speaking at this very important event. <clears throat> As all of you are well, well aware, the US peace movement has a long history of struggle against US imperialism's interventions in the internal affairs of other countries. But this history has had frequent ebbs and flows in different periods, depending on the political situation of the time. The massive demonstrations that appeared before George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq, during which close to half a million people, anti-war people, marched in Washington, D.C., dissipated after the start of the war and later went into hibernation with the election of Barack Obama in 2008. Although the warmongering policies of the US imperialism continued and even intensified during the Obama administration, the US peace movement remained relatively quiet in the fear of not attacking the first black president of the country. This silence also caused deepening fragmentation within the peace movement with regard to how to respond to Obama's intensified militaristic policies. While the left and anti-imperialist forces continued their active opposition to Obama administration's interventionist policies, the more liberal forces limited themselves to signing petitions and appealing to various government authorities for policy changes. The election of Donald Trump as president, however, created the potential for reviving the peace movement once again. 
it removed all masks and pretensions by opening, by openly threatening uh, several countries uh, with regime change and imposing or intensifying illegal U.S. economic sanctions against the targeted countries in the Middle East, Latin America, and Africa, especially Syria, Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, and many others, and escalating aggressive policies against China and expanding the U.S. military interventions in Africa through AFRICOM. Trump's blatant imperialist threats also brought to the fore the conflict between the anti-imperialist and the liberal center forces within the peace movement. The liberal center forces, under the influence of persistent media demonization of the leaders of nations like Iran, Syria, Venezuela, and even Russia and China, refused to take side against U.S. imperialism interventions with the phony excuse that both sides are bad. This was a great opportunity for us to bring the left and anti-imperialist peace forces together and initiate the formation of a united front that would be able to force the whole peace movement to take sides against U.S. imperialism interventions. The problem before us, however, was that various organizations within the movement were fighting for peace independently of each other. Some were fighting against environment and environmental destruction. Some were fighting against war. Others were fighting to, for reducing the military spending, etc. Each separately from each other and without recognizing that all those problems are various symptoms of the same imperial system. So the key element which would make it possible to involve liberal center forces in a united front with the anti-imperialists was to find an aspect of imperialist system which almost everyone agreed on without necessarily being anti-imperialist ideologically. This led us to conclude that the focusing, that focusing on close to 1,000 US fallen military bases around the world would best serve the purpose of getting the liberal center forces involved in an anti-imperialist struggle, albeit from a different, their own perspective. <clears throat> With the US foreign military bases at, as the main instrument and launching pad of all US imperialism's military aggressions around the world, we drafted a unity statement and presented it to all uh, anti-imperialist allies in the peace movement for the creation of the broadest anti-imperialist coalition in the United States after several decades, namely the coalition against US foreign military bases. The new coalition brought together for the first time a broad range of forces, including some significant segments of the liberal center forces that had refused to take side against imperialism in the past. The result of these efforts was the convening of two tremendously successful and popular anti-basis conferences first in Baltimore, Maryland in January 2018, and second in a, an international one in Dublin, Ireland in November 2018. Of course, my dear comrade Ajamu and Black Alliance for Peace played a key role in this process. This coalition was further expanded into, global, into the global campaign against US NATO military bases, and also gave rise to the present growing coalition against Africa. These developments were clear indications that we were successfully moving toward the creation of a united, unified anti-imperialist peace movement in the United States and around the world. But in spite of all of our uh, collective achievements, our peace movement is still too confused, fragmented, and weak to be able to put an end to imperialism's aggressions around the globe. The main reason for this confusion fragmentation and weakness, in my view, is, it lack, is its lack of general understanding of the nature of the imperial system itself among a significant part of global peace movement. Unless the concept of anti-imperialism assumes a central position in the peace movement analysis of our current situation, the confusion and weakness will linger on and will keep the peace movement from achieving its goals. We have, we have obviously come a long way in that direction. The broad anti-imperialist coalitions that, and campaigns that we have organized so far 
during the past decade testified to this fact. But moving forward and meeting the challenges that we face today requires that we further broaden, unify, and strengthen this anti-imperialist front by giving it a stronger coordinating structure, one that can bring all US and global anti-imperialist forces and organizations together under a single unified strategy for struggle. The formation of the broad global coalition against US intervention in Africa through Africa and the newly formed coalition against Cold War with China are significant steps by our anti-imperialist front in that important direction. I thank you wholeheartedly for including me in this process. Together, we shall be victorious. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bauman. Thank you so much. Uh, our, uh, our next panelist is a very modest man, uh, Aziz Fall. Uh, he is a political scientist and member of the Group for Research and Initiative for the Liberation of Africa. Uh, and I say he's modest because there's more we could have said of him, but uh, he is a distinguished academic and activist. And we're very happy that he's joining us today. Aziz Fall. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, good evening to everyone. Uh, thanks to the Black Alliance for Peace for this great opportunity to join you all. I'm delighted to participate in this webinar and happy to extend your greetings from all the members of the GRILA, the Research and Initiative Group for the Liberation of Africa, which is actually turning 36 years uh, in a few days. Uh, the title of our symposium, Full Spectrum Dominance from AFRICOM to Indo-Pacific Command, is basically the hegemonic discourse that the Pentagon's warmongers would like the world to believe. In reality, this dominance is in decline, is in peril, and it is vomited by the peoples of the world who are aware of the seriousness of the impasse that the re-election of the Trump administration would push them into. We are at the crossroad that threaten humanity, the Anthropocene and its major component, the Capitalocene, the global economic crisis, and the global pandemic. In all three cases, Africa holds a solution, a greater human solidarity, an ontological respect for nature, and you can see actually the best result in the world in the face of the pandemic, despite of our underdevelopment. We are here today to enhance the repolitization of our masses as only a vibrant democracy in which concerned and informed citizens are fully engaged in decision-making and direct action can solve our problems. We are also opposing the Comprador's forces blindly following the warmongers. And we can say that the fate of the African survival depends on the outcome of this struggle. We welcome very prudently the recent decision to pull, off, uh, to pull out troops dedicated to Africa in Stuttgart, the African base in Germany. Just a friendly reminder, Grilla was among the first on the continent to stand in the way of the expansionist aim of the post-apartheid era. It is very likely that uh, this strategy that is now aging to play deployment and redeployment it is very likely that the alleged 1,200 US AFRICOM soldiers will be redeployed elsewhere in Europe, mainly in, in Poland or in other US Special Operation Command or in facilities in the African continent, depending on the strategy of warmongers. The relocation plan, which might take some time to implement, does not mention what may happen with forward bases like Ramstein, the strategic hub in the Middle East and Africa, and the headquarters of the US uh, force in Africa, like the US Special Operation Command. This is why we beg, we ask all progressive Americans to pressure their government to close these imperialist bases and to dismantle the so-called US strategic control of the African continent. Also, it has been almost 10 years now that we launched this campaign against AFRICOM. Guerrilla denounced AFRICOM in 2009 
and launched in 2013 on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the African independence, a declaration called Africom Go Home, neither in Africa nor in Germany. You can find that on the Grillo website. This is the very nature of imperialism, but imperialism is also slowly in a metamorphosis process. Imperialism from its multiple origins in the 17th century was refined after the Second World War under the dominant segment of the triad, the US, Europe, and Japan, and since the collapse of the USSR, has been undergoing the unipolar hegemony of the US. The dominant segment of transnational capital have essentially joined this movement under neoliberalism, even when the United States does not redistribute the share of this monopoly equitably. Successive White House administration have ambivalent attitudes toward the role of multinational bodies, the World Bank, IMF, WTO, or even the OECD, but even also NATO, where some European countries, which assert themselves in foreign policy, find their alliance cumbersome. The United States, especially under the Bush, Obama, and Trump administrations, continue to extend the Monroe Doctrine. It extends its Monroe Doctrine to the world, but also to its own society. You have seen how American society is military squared off and how the police and justice system is supported by a military apparatus that perpetuates impunity. We are all outraged today by the decision of the Louisville prosecutor not to prosecute for homicide the police officer who killed Breonna Taylor. Breonna Taylor, 26-year-old African-American woman, was murdered in her bed on March 13 when three officers broke into her home and broke down the door. We stand in solidarity with the struggle of Black Lives Matter activists and the global movement challenging anti-Black racism and white supremacy, and all those who fight against this racist and state violence. The movement to defend the police illustrate the coercive state function and whose interests they serve. This violence is translated outside the world in a quite simplistic American policy, as Samir Amin has clearly analyzed it and I've just refer to the film called Samir Amin, the organic internationalist that you can find in YouTube where in length he really depicts this strategy. But basically what it is, this strategy aims to contain its own European and Japanese allies and maintain their yoke on them by ensuring supremacy over NATO and adapting its strategy of Latin Americanization of any space it deems useful around the world. To ensure control of the oil slicks and vital transport resources and access to its markets. To also weaken Russia and China and any other emerging country likely to oppose its doctrine. But also to thwart nationalist or progressive experiments throughout the global south that could challenge locally the global order it establishes and ensure that less useful region of the world remain marginalized. To maintain this unjust order, military uh, spending have been doubled. Repression has increased everywhere. World prison numbers have increased almost 24 percent and border agency are mushrooming everywhere following the American uh, model. So surveillance and data technologies, monitoring and controlling activists and populations are generalized. This martial strategy translate into the division of the world into regional deployment and high command that aimed at achieving the objective set out uh, earlier and locally co-opting armed force or maintaining conflict to legitimize its sponsorship. A lot of leaders and entrepreneurs around the world follow and support blindly this flawed uh, vision that is slowly crystallizing into a front of warmongers comprising the world's most reactionary state. For us, it has been quite difficult over the years to convince our American brothers and sisters of the relevance of our struggle for all sorts of reasons. Among others, the American propaganda about its role as protector of the world, the constant propaganda depicting our advocacy as conspiracy analysis, the co-optation of American civilian and military in the rhetoric of America's patriotic defense, but also the increasing 
destabilization of terrorism in Africa. But mainly our greater weakness, if I may say, um, is the fact that we could not really translate uh, to our own masses uh, the complex dynamic of uh, their ex expression. Because first, our masses are caught up in the management of daily life and the problems of underdevelopment, and they are often perceiving these issues are too complex, long-term, or without really capacity to control them. Uh, this must be also added to the powerlessness of our elite who have surrendered to the blackmail of uh, the geo strategist from Washington, and they are often dependent of the outside financially, uh, technologically, and militarily supporting them. Um, and the, the worst scenario is, in fact, the weakness of the Pan-Africanist uh, strategy, uh, where we are scattered and spreaded in many, many families. So uh, the extension and the extension of this American system and the co-optation of our military leadership and regimes uh, is actually uh, quite significant. And for sure, the American are not the, the only one. The French presence also we should mention, and we have new players like Russia, Turkey, and even China. Um, as it is uh, predicted in that film and also uh, showed in a recent study from the University of Maryland. Um, truly, uh, there is no uh, decrease of the so-called transnational attacks. In fact, we witness an increase of these uh, so-called transnational attacks and terrorism, and uh, everyone could see the catastrophe of Libya today and how so many forces have undermined this country. So the American administration changed, but the system remained the same. The US is in fact a great power that tries to temper its decline by cunning and force. And this explains in fact why we have today a resurgence of uh, NATO and American strategy toward the, the continent to contain China and other BRICS states. Uh, for us, it had been quite clear that uh, the situation that we are facing in, um, in regard to the economy of our countries uh, is probably the most difficult to, to address uh, due to the disintegration as a result of more than three decades of structural adjustments, downsizing of the states, uh, managerial governance, uh, democratic diversion and depolitization. Most of the African states at the military level and the civilian level have been scattered, weakened, and disunite uh, over the fundamental issues of occupation uh, of those military forces, whether on theater of conflict in Congo, in Libya, or Burkina Faso, or elsewhere in Nigeria, or even in Mozambique. And the case of Mali is probably one of the most interesting that is uh, revealing these days. But basically, there is a blackmail uh, of instability that threatens most of our countries. And this unusual insecurity on the continent uh, is certainly fueled by a strategy of uh, maintaining marginal areas and, and controlling the wealth of the resources in others. Um, the United States surround Chinese territory with a string of bases, but it's the same strategy that they are trying to do uh, in the African continent by trying to undermine the, the role of, of China in the 21st century under the guise of the war on terror uh, that has done everything but get rid of terrorism. So, uh, you know, this world capitalist uh, system creates an aspiration that it cannot uh, satisfy for the multitude uh, who of course are attracted by the beam of light like uh, flabbergasted butterflies and a lot of our youth today are kind of lost with this uh, American propaganda, you know, you can go through music, through sport, et cetera. But in fact, it is a very complex hegemonical system uh, that uh, try to temper their decline and co-op the bourgeoisie of the emerging countries and the African states into this big agenda. So, you know, uh, it is up to Africa to defend its sovereignty and to take advantage 
uh, of the diversified South-South perspective of cooperation and solidarity that are still possible. It is uh, now the time to reinforce the Pan-African strong uh, uh, position on building a stronger state, uh, a confederal state, and this is something that uh, is the only option to fight against the uh, implosion that they want to create. And these military powers competing on our soil are not omnipotent. They are riddled with contradictions and could not abuse their advantage so much if Africa is united. Unfortunately for now, most of our regimes are comprador, meaning they are subordinate to imperialism, and they have only a short-term view in managing this crisis. We believe uh, that um, this is the, the, the cornerstone of our struggle, try to convince uh, with decision makers that this is the wrong path. And, uh, you know, we have defeated apartheid and we'll continue to fight for the sovereignty of the entire continent so that the children and diaspora can once again uh, flourish there. And I'm sure that uh, the effort of BAP, among other uh, efforts of activists, will certainly allow us to succeed very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aziz. Uh, that was Aziz Fall. Uh, before we go on to our next panelist, we are going to have a video interlude. That new African is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. Africans don't need Africa. Mutual respect, man and woman. Equal rights and respect for each other. That's what we need. That's what we need. We don't need African. Yeah. Africans don't need African. No, no, no. No need, no need for Americans' military. Africans don't need 
Great. Thank you so much. That was D the Peacemaker, a uh, Nigerian recording artist. Uh, our next, and I want to remind our uh, panelists about uh, interpretation and uh, not speaking as quickly as we normally would. Uh, our next panelist is Danny Haifong. Danny is a contributing editor to Black Agenda Report. He is also a co-coordinator of the BAP Supporter Network and an organizer for the No Cold War campaign. He is co-author of the book, American Exceptionalism and American Innocence, A People's History of Fake News from the Revolutionary War to the War on Terror. Danny Haifong. Thank you, Margaret, and greetings, comrades. It is an honor to be speaking at this symposium on behalf of the No Cold War campaign. I'm also humbled to be part of the BAP Supporter Network as a co-coordinator and to assist in whatever capacity possible to strengthen Black and African-led organizations such as Black Alliance for Peace, fighting for peace and liberation. We have a monumental problem on our hands and that is this new Cold War against China. Uh, we have a peace forum as part of the No Cold War campaign coming up in a couple of days on Saturday. Please do register and the Black Alliance for Peace has been generous enough to share that and to participate in the event. But the issue of the US's policy of full spectrum dominance is very much part of this new Cold War. And it is connected to a host of contradictions afflicting the US imperial order at this time. For nearly a decade, US military power has made an enormous strategic shift to both the Asia Pacific and to Africa. I mean, Africa. At the center of this transition is the growth of China as an economic world power and the decline of the US as a global hegemon. China has much to offer Africa and the global South at this time. China shares a common history of colonialism an imperialist humiliation with Africa and the rest of the global South. It has the experience of successfully carrying out a struggle for national liberation and defending that struggle from the challenges of a hostile global context. And now China is in possession of an economic miracle that it is committed to sharing with African nations as well as nations in Latin America and Asia. That miracle comes with advanced infrastructure such as high-speed rail and 5G technology, both of which are necessary for breaking down just some of the barriers to economic sovereignty that colonial underdevelopment has placed on much of the global South, Africa included, Africa especially. The quote-unquote China threat mentioned so often by US officials in all quarters of Washington DC is a different kind of projection of power, a psychological projection of the coming end of the US's ability to dictate global affairs without any significant challenge. The United States, unlike China, has little to offer Africa or the rest of the global South. US share in the global economy has shrunk and the economic crisis precipitated by the COVID-19 pandemic will only accelerate this trend. Many nations in the global South, especially African nations, have experienced generation after generation of poverty and underdevelopment under the US dominated financial arrangements of the IMF and World Bank. US imperialism has deployed much of its military arsenal to Africa and Asia to arrest the possibility of South-South cooperation replacing US and Western domination. The US ruling class though, it, it's not in complete agreement over how to carry out the related tasks of containing China's rise in suppressing the self-determination of African nations. Former President Barack Obama expanded the US Africa Command to all but a single African country, principally to gain political and military influence over African governments and persuade them over time to reject China. AFRICOM's growth also aligned with the Obama administration's quote unquote pivot to Asia, which ultimately laid the basis for the massive militarization of the Asia Pacific that Trump now oversees. China's containment was primarily regarded in this period as a project of military coercion, where nations in Africa and Asia would bow to the dictates of the United States without needing to engage in direct conflict with 
with China. Large sections of the Pentagon were not satisfied with this strategy. Out of the lust for a more confrontational approach with China came the strategy of great power competition. This strategy did not neglect the pivot to Asia, but rather buttressed the military encirclement of China with a host of maneuvers. Even more military assets have been shifted to the US Indo-Pacific Command, once called the Pacific Command, to the point of potentially draining AFRICOM itself of its own military resources. This would, as AFRICOM's Commander General Stephen Townsend pointed out in at the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee earlier this year, leave the US vulnerable to losing access to the rare earth minerals and other vital resources on the continent that quote unquote, America needs. The disagreement within the military industrial complex over how to best contain China is a matter of form, not substance. Full spectrum dominance is where the entirety of the US political and military apparatus has reached uniform consensus. China and Africa are thus not only connected by their hundreds of billions of dollars worth in trade arrangements, but also by their experience as targets of imperialism. The US Indo-Pacific Command is currently in possession of over, all, of over half of all US military assets with more coming. 400 US military bases surround China in countries such as Japan, South Korea, in the US colony of Guam. While AFRICOM may be partially reduced to strengthen the US's military presence in the Asia Pacific, there is no doubt that the US will continue to undermine African sovereignty and use China, and to a smaller degree Russia, as justification. The last and perhaps most important point that I want to make is that the struggle for the self-determination of oppressed nations is always an ideological struggle. Full spectrum dominance is a racist project. US and Western media portray Africa and China in much of the same light. Africa is portrayed in the corporate media as a chaotic and backward continent where corruption is endemic and inherent to political life. Africa needs the US military to be safe and secure from itself. China, on the other hand, is the chief quote unquote authoritarian country in the world for its supposed suppression of Muslims in Xinjiang, protesters in Hong Kong, and according to The Economist, people in mainland China by way of its anti-poverty campaign. Asia therefore needs the US military to be safe and secure from China. These jingoistic portrayals of China and Africa provide fertile ideological ground for the US empire to maintain and expand military operations under the guise of stamping out terrorism or countering the quote unquote China threat. The transformation of Africa into a terrain for US militarism has also brought about an ideological shift in the United States from a white savior industrial complex attitude of charity to a return of the white man's burden mentality of re-civilizing the continent by way of force. And just as we know AFRICOM to be a coordinated military assault in the broader project of US-led neocolonialism, so too is the US's military buildup in the Asia Pacific, part of a broader project to establish US compliant governments in China and the rest of Asia. China is no longer just a convenient scapegoat for the hollowing out of the US capitalist economy. Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, as well as other military contractors, directly fund think tanks like the Australian Strategic Policy Initiative to villainize China so that the US can ban their social media apps, close their consulates, and sanction Chinese government officials in the name of the US's military strategy of great power competition. A key task in developing a united movement to eradicate US military expansionism in Africa and in Asia is to be very clear about its severe consequences for the future of humanity at large. The US-led overthrow of Libya in 2011 paved the way for the death and displacement of millions in Africa and the Middle East, as well as the expansion of AFRICOM. US attempts to gain political and military control of the Asia Pacific means that nations in this region will be subject to the same political 
in military and economic development model uh, uh, employed in the continent of Africa. China and Africa are targets of the same criminal system that produces conditions of economic and political instability all over the world. And while the US would be foolish to provoke a hot war with China and anti-imperialist forces the world over would be equally as foolish to leave the cause of peace and self-determination up to the aggressors. We have but one enemy comrades and that is US imperialism and its mission of full spectrum dominance. A dying empire is a dangerous empire. China will continue to rise as a global power and will not be bullied into submission. China's connections with the global South and Africa in particular cannot be arrested. The people of China and the people of Africa must be free to determine their destinies without interference from the US military. It is our duty to demand that the US Indo-Pacific Command withdraw its forces from the Asia Pacific and the US Africa Command withdraw from the African continent wholly and completely. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Danny. Um, we now have our uh, last uh, panelist, not last, not least. Uh, and I wanna thank all of our panelists again for uh, giving of their time for us at this uh, very important meeting. Uh, Afiang El Afiang is the executive director of the Moyo Pan-African Solidarity Center, formerly based in Accra in London, now in Nigeria and London. The center promotes awareness and knowledge on the wealthy legacy of Africa's contribution to world history and human development. Afiang is also the co-founder of Moyo Wa Taifa, a Pan-African women's network created to establish links between African women on the continent and in the diaspora. Afiang El Afiang. Um, greetings. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. Excellent. Um, thank you so, so much. Um, my name is Afi Young, and um, I'd like to start, you know, by bringing warm revolutionary greetings from my colleagues and I in Moyo Wataifa, the Pan-African Women's Network, and the um, Pan-African Solidarity Center. Um, you know, thank you so much, you know, to the Black um, Peace Alliance, you know, for the work that you do and the work that we're doing together, you know, as partners in this struggle. Um, I'm going to be focusing on, you know, the link between Africom and um, Africa's neocolonial leaders, um, because we really are in dire straits here. Um, the history of Africom is that Africom was actually conceptualized and um, initiated by um, Osajefo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, uh, the first president of Ghana along with, you know, some of the um, African leaders at that time. So contrary to the information, to what we think generally that AFRICOM is an American, um, you know, something the Americans started, it's not. It, it's, it's something they stole from um, Africa in the um, late 50s and 60s, I think it was in the early 60s that they started AFRICOM, the African Military High Command. And that it was actually operational for, for a few years uh, before you know they sort of stopped work because of some of the contradictions you know they were having and you know issues of logistics and you know it, it stopped and then of course as we know in um, 1966 the um, CIA coup against um, Dr Kwame Nkrumah's government happened and you know they took him off the scene and so that totally you know disappeared. Of course, you know, the AFRICOM that um, Nkrumah initiated and founded along with, you know, some of the leaders at that time was an African high command for the interest of Africans. So it was an agency, you know, to defend Africa by Africans, for Africans and with Africans. So what happened, you know, um, in the 60s and when AFRICOM, you know, was uh, finally reestablished decades later, by the Americans was a clear case of, um, you know, there being a vacuum 
and you know, and African neocolonialism um, becoming consolidated. You know, the neocolonial states on the continent, you know, um, became you know they consolidated, and so you know it gave a perfect um, you know soil. I hope I'm not speaking too fast for that. I'm just remember <laughs> translation <laughs> a yes. little slower. <laughs> No, no, I'm saying, I, but I hope I'm not speaking too fast because I usually do. You're okay. Um, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. So it it gave um, you know a space and a justification, um, you know, for the rise for the for the reemergence of Africom this time, you know, as a, an American concept. But well, it's extremely important for us to know that. You know, as an American concept. And by the way, um, I hear us talking about Africom and like this evening we're, you know, making the links between, you know, Africom and Asia. But apparently there, there are also high commands for different parts of the world, you know, and that's something we're going to need to dig into. Um, clearly, you know, my, our own concern, ours, you know, as, um, you know, Africans is, is Africom because it is the most prominent of this um, criminal, um, you know, military um, invaders, but there is an Asian High Command also, um, I believe, and there's another one. But anyway, but Africa of clearly is the most um, prominent. Now, like I said, you know, um, neo-colonial states, you know, um, became consolidated. So Africa, you know, was burst again. And it began to grow. I want to um, give an example of some of the places Africa thrives in. Well, yes, the concept of Africa, because as we know, there are military bases all over the continent. But just three, I just want to quickly, you know, um, speak about three countries. First of all, Liberia. Liberia, as we know, is um, an African country that has its motherland, so to speak, in America. And so there's a direct... Um, link between Liberia and America. Um, as we know, um, President um, Salif Johnson, when she was president, actually openly invited Africa, you know, to come and establish a base. Yes, somebody, yes, somebody has just put out the information of all the other military high commands that there are. I think they're up to seven, yes. But Africa is the most prominent. Now, so the Liberian president at that time, you know, so reactionary and backwards, um, you know, actually invited Africa to come and use Liberia, you know, as a base, you know, where other countries were rejecting Africa, not because the president's belief, you know, um, had any ideological opposition. To Africa, but because of John, you know, from the masses um, to this height, you know, was openly working with Africa and open Africa. Then you have a country like Ghana. Well, so the 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 US did not um, take up the invitation. Um, did not take up an invitation um, from Liberia because you know I think you know it, it wasn't big enough and it wasn't strategic enough. So that was that. Um, but, you know, Liberia continued to offer an inroad onto the continent. Now, the other country I want to highlight is Ghana. Now, Ghana is a very significant country for the imperialists and where Africa, you know, has um, a substantial presence. And the reason for this is that, um, first of all, Ghana, the history of Ghana as the country, the country that opened up, you know, the pathway of, um, you know, independence, you know, for, for the fight against colonialism, you know, and, you know, that gained, you know, uh, political independence, well, semi-political independence from um, colonial colonialism um, under the leadership of um, Osadi for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. So Ghana is a very significant country historically, uh, for us as Africans. And for that same reason, you know, imperialism, you know, saw the need, you know, to also utilize the significance and the symbolism of Ghana. So Ghana is a country, it, it's like they're poking Nkrumah's eyes in his grave and saying, you know, the country that you hold up, you know, as the, you know, the crown of Pan-Africanism as, as it were, you know, that is where you know, we will 
consolidate ourselves, you know, um, to the full. So there's a presence in Ghana, and that's why um, uh, Mr. Neocolonial uh, Obama made it a point of duty, you know, to, to visit Ghana in the year of Nkrumah's, um, of the centenary celebration for Nkrumah, you know, and you saw the disgraceful manner that, you know, um, he was received, you know, with with excitement, and it just shows you the depth, how deep we are, you know, into this um, cancer of neocolonialism. So Obama's visit there was strategic. Africom's presence in Ghana is strategic, you know, and it's also very concrete. You know, the American embassy uh, in Ghana now, after, you know, they were bombed out of, um, I think it was Kenya, and the, the, um, the, the, the aura of invincibility was totally shattered, you know, when the um, you know, embassy was attacked in um, Kenya. So they, they, they've they changed, you know, they, they moved to Accra, um, you know, to Ghana. So they have a, a very serious, you know, presence there. And, you know, there's some stories about, you know, them having access to the airport. I think the um, Kotoka International Airport was, not I think, it was built by Americans. Now, imagine if your airport is built by Americans. What that means is that, you know, they have all the plans, you know, the ground, the underground, and, you know, there's supposed to be underground tunnels and all this stuff. So I'm just using this as examples to show where, you know, they're consolidated. <laughs> now, the relationship with Nigeria is interesting. Um, I think it was in the 60s or so, the British attempted to have, um, they attempted to have a military base in Nigeria. And at that time, you know, the Nigerian student movement, you know, rose up so forcefully against this, you know, so they had to back off, the government had to back off. Now, again, um, in 2000, I've forgotten which year, one of our uh, presidents went to the U.S., and as, as usual, you know, first of all, they beg for official state visits. <laughs> so he got an invitation, went to the U.S., and the Americans, you know, said to him, you know, you know, for Nigeria to host AFRICOM. So, of course, he agreed, you know, there in Washington. <laughs> and, of course, you know, the news came out. By the time he got back home, you know, the, the, there was a, you know, protest about that. And people warned, you know, that you better, you know, take back that invitation, you know, for Nigeria to host, um, uh, you know, a, a military base here. So that, you know, was taken back. But you see, that's not the end of the story. Um, as you know, there are military bases all over the continent. Now, the way, the modus operandi of AFRICOM um, on the continent is this. You know, they present themselves as development partners, you see. Um, they're not here, you know, as, with their propaganda, they're not here, you know, to do anything terrible or to attack us. They're here, they, you know, they, they're on the continent to help us, you know, to train our forces, you know, uh, give us skills, you know, develop our capacity, protect us from ourselves and our enemies and, you know, all this nonsense. So that's how, you know, they project themselves, you know, the modus uh, operandi. And so what you then have is that um, our neocolonial leaders are some of the most loyal agents of imperialism. You know, normally when you have agents in a country, it's normally people doing things in a sneaky manner. But actually, um, we now have our leaders, our so-called heads of state, who are, you know, the agents, you know, so to speak. So it's, it's, it's very interesting, you know. Um, and, you know, the other way, you know, thing they do, there's a use of, you know, soft power. So they also facilitate, you know, maybe cultural programs. They have a lot of programs, you know, that they invite people from different um, sections of the society to attend. Now, I found out that um, there's the major thing that they use. They invite, on, to, on a lot of programs, they invite members of our media um, groups, you know, so our journalists, you know, media editors, publishers, you know, they usually, you know, invite them, you know, to the U.S. or to some of their bases, and you know, you give them, you know, they stay in five star hotels, you know, give them excellent treatment. So of course, you know, to to reassure them that Africa is not this, you know, um, horrible, you know, thing, you know, that um, uh, extremists 
you know, like uh, the Black Alliance for Peace, you know, paint them, you know, to be. It's this wonderful, you know, oppression and, and they're very open and come around, you know, and see, you know, what we're doing, not only to the U.S., sorry, also to when they were um, in Stuttgart in Germany. I don't know if they're still there. So when they invite them, you know, take them on tours around their bases, take them around the U.S. and all of this, our media come back singing praises to the high heavens about outcome. Yeah? Now, what that, I'll, and I'll give an example without, you know, uh, mentioning the specific country. So um, they, 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 one of the uh, media people went on this tour that I'm speaking about. So at that time, he was working in a key, um, uh, key, it was a radio station, a very major radio station in West Africa. And uh, what do you know now? He's a minister of information in one of the governments. So do you see that? Those of you who know about how people are groomed, you know, into, become, in, into becoming intelligence sources, you know, or, you know, agents, you know, who are courted and groomed, you know how this works. As I speak now, and that's why I didn't want to mention the specific country, he's the minister of information. So you see that, so they now have, AFRICOM now has a friendly person, quote unquote, you know, as the minister of information. And these are the other things they do, you know, when they caught, you know, our people, and then they also push for them to, you know, get into strategic, you know, um, positions. So of course, that kind of person, you know, if you start to argue with the government that, oh, you know, we shouldn't do this, they already have him, you know, that's their person. So like I said, you know, there's a lot of soft power used, you know, they use diplomacy. Um, one of the other things they do, because some of the work we do is also to monitor our newspapers on a daily basis. And you find, you know, that um, yeah, they report the visit, you know, of the US military and, you know, somebody from Africa, you know, like there's a visiting royalty, you know. Uh, you know, uh, one of our most wonderful friends is visiting and they attend, they, they go to schools, they, they visit them in the embassies, you know, they go to different agencies, different places, you know, to make themselves look normal. Uh, the other thing that the U.S. does is that the, the, the ambassadors they send to the continent here, like at one time, you know, we had an American ambassador, and by the way, there are a lot of African-American ambassadors that are sent, you know, um, here to the continent. And so this one that was in Ghana at, at one time, you know, when, when I, you know, um, some years back, she had locks, you know? So this woman had dread locks. I mean, she was as real as real can get. You know, she would attend all sorts of things, burials, funeral ceremonies, naming ceremonies, you know, anything you invited this U.S. ambassador, she was there. But I'm saying that this was a way of now bringing Africa, you know, as a normal thing. And of course, you know, she would come with some of these other people. So the, the, the imperialism is like a friendly it is a friend, so to speak. And it's not just the friend of the ruling class. It's even the friend of, you know, the activist class. So these are some of the ways that, you know, they perpetrate through their soft power. So they use agencies, they use NGOs to legitimize the presence and the concept of African. So let me round up by saying our weakness is in the absence of a revolutionary pan-Africanist networks. You know, this is where, you know, we are weak in, in terms of not, you know, raising the flag and letting people know that, you know, these are uh, hyenas, you know, or like the proverbial thing about them being wolves, you know, in sheep clothing. And so our challenge is going to be, you know, the rebirth, you know, of a global African peace movement to expose, you know, these agencies, which is what you know, the Black Alliance for Peace is doing now, you know, in terms of trying to, you know, develop a, a global alliance and not just, you know, on Africa, but on all the other military high commands, you know, against this. And those of us at Moyo Wataifa, the Pan-African Women's Network and the Moyo Solidarity Center, you know, are very, um, you know, proud, you know, and happy to be working, to be, you know, part of the alliance, you know, working to expose this, you know, and to defeat it. Because indeed, you know, that is the key challenge of the 21st century, the defeat of neocolonialism. And AFRICOM is the military arm of neocolonialism. I'll just leave it there for now, um, Comrade Margaret, and, you know, wait to get some questions. Thank you. 
All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Afian. Um, uh, thank you all. Thank you again to all of our uh, panelists. And uh, before we go to your questions, I wanted to uh, talk about our US Out of Africa Network, which is the organizational arm of uh, the US Out of Africa Shut Down AFRICOM campaign. And if you would like uh, to be a part of the uh, Out of Africa Network, I'm going to put in the chat uh, how you can do that. So the link is in the chat. And uh, as um, um, a member of the US Out of Africa Network, you will get our AFRICOM Watch Bulletin twice a month. Our latest uh, edition, these are, this is an example of the information you will get. Uh, U.S. military conducting airstrikes in Somalia. Revealed the CIA and MI6 secret war in Kenya. U.S. militarism toward China as part and parcel of American hegemony syndrome. Thank you, Danny. Uh, China releases report on U.S. military presence in Asia Pacific, warns of increased conflict risk. China's trade with Africa grows. U.S. African trade lagging despite free access and uh, so on. So um, uh, please check out the link. We urge you to be part of our, our network and uh, that you will get this, uh, this great information, you know, that you won't get anywhere else. I think uh, anyone joining us today realizes um, uh, the need for independent sources of information. You already know that uh, reading the papers of record and uh, watching uh, US networks won't tell you what's going on in the world. So uh, the US Out of Africa Network is um, a, a powerful addition to for all of us in our uh, efforts to educate ourselves. Uh, so we want to give you a chance to uh, ask questions. We already have a few here, um, and um, some of them are directed towards individual panelists. Some anyone can answer. Um, this is a question for Danny Haifong. China's expansion into Africa is strictly economic and not military. So is it wrong to say China, even if one opposes mining extraction there and other eco-damaging policies, but it's wrong to say China is a rival imperialist nation like America, Britain, France, and much of the West? So he's directed the question toward to Danny, but um, after Danny responds, if any of our other panelists want to speak up, that's fine. Well, China's activity in Africa is certainly a different in many respects, if not in all respects, to the way that the U.S. and the West conduct themselves. Uh, you know, China, it's uh, operating within a global order, which is primarily capitalist. And um, there are, of course, contradictions with, uh, you know, uh, China and Africa's relationship. But in on the whole, and I think on the final analysis, it's important to recognize that uh, while uh, China has, in some respects, um, you know, employed its military to Djibouti, for example, um, there is no uh, political interference and any um, terms that China imposes onto African countries to ultimately sow their dependency, which is primarily how the United States and the West have conducted themselves by both economically and militarily expanding on the African continent to ensure that African countries um, are, uh, you know, fully dependent upon the economies of the world powers. So uh, on that basis, I'll leave it to the other panelists. Yeah, may, may I add a small thing again? Yes, go ahead, Aziz. Yes, uh, you know, Chinese market socialism is also being hit by bourgeois tendencies and the impulses of Mandarin oligarchs uh, concerned only with their own interest. But these oligarchs are nothing without the Chinese state. 
there is a delicate balance of power and a deaf internal struggle going on in China. If the pro-business uh, trend triumphs, Africa will have to guard against what will be an assertive social imperialism. But for the time being, apart from e economic hegemony and its voracity for raw materials, um, on the pretext of defending its economic and commercial interests in the Gulf of Aden, China has just followed Japan uh, for a military facility. So they have a facility and uh, logistical space in Obok, which is currently under American control. So uh, whether it's there or more likely somewhere else, this sets a dangerous escalation. Uh, the industrial free zone that was signed by Djibouti and the security of this new Silk Road on African soil raised the geopolitical covetousness of imperialism on the continent uh, a notch. But at that time, China would more than objectively join the center of imperialism by violating its non-aligned and South-South discourse. But China, until then, was mainly defending what is inside its wall, and it is aware of its increased power, and what is this is uh, causing us fear around the world. Um, so it is anxious to reassure both imperialism and the countries of Africa, which for the time being can still benefit from this South-South exchange intelligently if their interest uh, of the people come first. So um, I think the analysis that, that Daniel have raised is absolutely correct. Okay. Thank you so much, Aziz. A uh, couple of other questions. Uh, one is uh, for you, Aziz. Uh, why do you think the U.S. is having so much difficulty establishing the AFRICOM headquarters on the continent itself? There is no difficulty as such. In fact, they, they don't need a mega base. Uh, what they have succeeded is, as I have explained in, in that film, uh, is really to co-opt and have their facility entry, you know, access to most of the African states, mainly 40 states. So, in fact, you know, from their panoptic position that they have in NATO, from the other uh, states that are, as Afyong uh, have explained, are already a given, they don't necessarily need that mega base, which will be just a hassle. And as you see, uh, they are trying to actually dismantle and miniaturize some of their own military uh, military uh, facilities. So um, the, the, I don't necessarily see a big, huge base, you know, which is just going to be a, a burden for them at this stage. But having many facilities and, and competing in, in, in areas is more likely to happen in the near future. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, for Afiang, um, can, can you tell us how uh, we get AFRICOM out of Africa uh, uh, while dealing with the issue of African neo-colonial leadership? And um, also, uh, what role can Africans outside of the continent play in that fight? Thank you, uh, Margaret. There are a couple of things. Um, the first thing is, and I think uh, my brother um, Aziz had um, spoken about that, that you know, there's still a problem of being able to um, put out this information to the you know masses of our people as to you know how terrible this project is. Because first of all, there are existential issues. You know, people are more concerned with bread and butter things in front of them. Secondly, they haven't physically seen you know um, the Americans in the streets. At one time, you know, they used to in in Ghana in Accra, they used to do some you know practice just like exercises you know um, uh, openly, and there was some you know complaint about that, so they disappeared. I think in other countries they do their exercises privately, you know, i.e. behind you know closed spaces and things. But the point is one of the first things we are going to need to do is to have a very prominent and activist and robust and dynamic peace movement here on the continent. And I'm calling it a peace movement for lack of a better you know, word. So we're going to have to have that, number one, uh, so that we're able to explain consistently to our people and, you know, um, highlight, you know, these things. So that that is, I think, for me, you know, one way. Uh, but along with that, you know, it's going to be the question of also attempting to frame 
you know, a, a struggle, the struggle against neocolonialism <clears throat> in a way that can resonate with our people. Because like I always say, you know, the struggle for colonialism was easier in the sense that you could see that these are foreigners, these are people from outside, and these were Europeans, you know, they looked different. So, you know, you could tell there was a problem. But now with neocolonialism, these are our own people. They look exactly like us. You know, how are we going to tackle them? So we need to be able to, you know, uh, frame a struggle, a popular struggle, you know, around that and to make the links, you know, the connections. Because like I said, when the African generals come visiting, they are received with such fanfare here. You know, the governors, you know, uh, want to meet up with them, you know, the president in in, in government, you know, the, the NGOs, you know, everybody sees them basically you know, they've, they've, the propaganda is so powerful that they are seen as, you know, development, what they call it, development partners. So that's, that's our challenge. So it just reminds me of the second or the second part to your question, Margaret. The second part of the, I think you covered it. Uh, well, how can the role that uh, those of us uh, in the diaspora can play? Oh, okay. Um, first of all, you know, by supporting the work, you know, that we're doing here on the continent, you know, I think that as we grow in terms of working with the alliance, you know, um, we'll begin to highlight that more, you know, um, those, you know, the anti, you know, African activists based on the continent, um, because, you know, the work would need, you know, support with resources, you know, uh, support, solidarity, lots of different ways. So that can come, you know, through keeping up, you know, with the work of the uh, alliance, you know, who is working across the Atlantic, so to speak, it's one concrete, you know, way. Let me just I saw something in the chat, you know, uh, that was directed at me, uh, Margaret. Let me say that in terms of understanding the struggles in Africa, um, those those who want to know, you know, if you Google the name Kwame Nkrumah, Kwame K W A M E, and the surname Nkrumah N K R U M A H, if somebody can help me put that in the chat box, if you Google that, you will come up with. I think he has about fifteen or eighteen books. Okay, um, you know that all speak about you know the African struggle and all of that, but. The one book, you know, that deals, you know, directly with this question of, you know, uh, military, you know, occupation and the attacks and the politics is a book titled Challenge of the Congo. Challenge of the Congo. Somebody helps him put that there. And it's a case study of foreign pressures in an independent African state. Of course, it's focused, you know, around, you know, Lumumba and the Congo and all the maneuvers, you know, so you know all the dramatis personae, you know, the United Nations, you know, and the role they played and the role they continue to play under the guise of being, uh, you know, a United Nations. Um, you know, AFRICOM in its name wasn't, you know, it didn't have that name then, but that's exactly what happened. You know, the maneuvers that went on there and all the other different military forces. So that uh, that book specifically would give anyone a concrete idea on, you know, the maneuvers and the politics. But there are other books, you know, his books like Africa Must Unite uh, and Class Struggle in Africa. And so you could, you know, go online, get some of these books for those who want to learn more. Uh, but in terms of specifically on the question of Africa, man, my brother Aziz would probably have more information on some concrete things that anybody can read up, you know, to know, you know, more about Africa. But for me, I would certainly recommend a Challenge of the Congo by Nkrumah. Um, you won't see Africom there as Africom, you know, per se, because it was in the 60s. But you will see, you know, the um, maneuvers by imperialism and how they were able to, you know, assassinate um Patrice Lumumba of the Congo, and eventually hold the Congo to host it, which continues still today. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you very much. Uh, did you want to uh, uh, add anything to that? Any of our panelists uh, reading? Uh, Afyang has given us some suggestions uh, for books we might want to read. So if you do have any suggestions, you can put them, uh, put them in the chat for us. Uh, I have a question for uh, Baman, Baman Azad. What are the challenges of developing pressure to close U.S. bases with the Congress that can't even reduce the military budget by 10 percent? Well, the main challenge in our experience uh, is the lack of information on the part of the people know uh, about the dimensions of, of the uh, uh, 
U.S. bases around the world. I mean, when we started this campaign, people were shocked. When we talked about 800 to 1,000 bases compared to other countries, you know, 99% of bases around the world are United States and NATO bases. And people don't know anything about that. So one of the, one of the challenges is really informational. That is, we have to bring that information to the public. But the problem is that the bases themselves, unless something happens, do not make much news. Mm -hmm. And that is another problem because when U.S. starts attacking somewhere, then immediately a lot of people are agitated and, and, and get to, the, the, to do something about it. But this has been going on for decades. And the... It is mostly the countries, people of the countries that are hosting those bases that are objecting. Um, but the U.S. side, you know, we being away by 3,000 miles from each side by oceans and, and not hearing what is going on. Even for a long time, we started the, the campaign together with the, with the Okinawa activists uh, to... Uh, close the the, the the bases and stop the expansion of the bases of Okinawa, but it went on for a while and then dropped out. So uh, another one is is lack of resources to begin with. Uh, attention of various organizations is focused on various more urgent issues sometimes. Um, you know, for them, the priority does not come to be a question of military bases. Um, but one thing that we, I think, uh, we have started the campaign together with Black Alliance and others, um, uh, to campaign to cut the military budget because the backbone of all of these uh, actions and operations is the funding. And if we can dry up that funding, uh, we can also contribute to the closure of the bases and other other operations, military operations. So. Um, this campaign is calling for passing city city council resolutions across the country that would oppose the, the military budget and call for the, the cut. And you know, Barbara Lee, uh, Representative Barbara Lee called for $350 billion cut, which is one third almost. Um, and then Congress settled on 10% and they started to add an amendment to that NDAA for a 10% cut, and it, it got the support of uh, about, uh, you know, Barbara uh, did about originally 10%, uh, 93 Congress people, which is significant, and we think we can build on that. Um, and then uh, had the vote of 43 opposed uh, to, to the military budget. So, but we, we have a struggle on our hand. That's not just the basis and all aspects of it. And I think, uh, the first thing we should do is to strengthen our peace movement to begin to, to, to uh, you know, have an impact. Thank you, Bowman. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question here about social media. Um, I hope everyone um, uh, on the webinar is aware of uh, what happened with uh, Leila Khaled uh, that, um, uh, a webinar she was uh, appearing on was first banned by Zoom. There was a group who protested at uh, Zoom's headquarters. Uh, they removed it. They, uh, the group went on and uh, uh, was on YouTube and YouTube cut them off. We um, uh, have a, a problem here with the independent media. We've become dependent on these platforms that can cut us off, who can censor at will. And this is for any panelist who wants to answer. Um, what is your thinking about how we may be able to fight that? Hmm. I know, it's a conundrum. <laughs> But I, I think it's something we should um, we should all be aware of. And if you're, um, uh, hello, let us, let us not be naive here. I think uh, yes. we are using tools uh, that the imperial order is using. I mean, yes. uh, they are probably listening to us today. 
whether this will help them, you know, understand uh, the scope of their own mistakes, whether, for example, they understand that the world spends nearly like three trillion of year on military expenditure. Uh, United States is almost 70%. So they, they know all those things. They know what we are doing. Uh, now they have their own instrument and sometimes, you know, advocacy against these instruments uh, in Google and, and you know, uh, Zoom, as you just mentioned recently, can certainly work because of lobbies and, and fear to lose market and so on. Uh, we need to, to have our counter propaganda. This is exactly why this film was, was shot. It was exactly not to rely on, on, you know, on the general media. And so in the social media spectrum, there are ways of, uh, you know, uh, having a counter propaganda strategy, knowing that the highways of information that we are using is their information systems. So maybe for those of you who are quite young, there were already a battle on the new order of uh, uh, in information and communication. This is called the, the McBride uh, report, and this is dating 1974, where already this imbalance on communication was addressed and how imperial force were actually masterminding and controlling the communication system. So we have to invent and be proactive and create our own ways, but also rely on more human uh, solidarity links, not to rely on the technology. Many of our people think that because you you sign a petition or you, you use your mouse, you're part of, of the action and, and revolution. Uh, this is part also of the strategy of the, the, the system. The real fight is in the street and in, in, the real, in the reality of the people. So I, I just say that basically we have a lot of social media going on. Um, so it's hard for a young person, for example, to know what is right and wrong. Uh, if you Google something, you would have thousands of occurrences on the algorithm. How would you find the right information? Most of it is polluted by the dominant media. So basically, we do have uh, ways to address this. We have to fight and have our own version of history, rewrite history, and make sure that uh, our means are conveyed. That's why like an exa example, what we are doing today is part of this same strategy, understanding that we could be listened to. Thank you. Thank you, Aziz. Uh, uh, we have a question about... Uh, oh, sorry, could I I'm sorry. Oh, go I'm ahead, Danny. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, well, I, a few thoughts, just really briefly. I think it's important, uh, one, to acknowledge all the things that have been said about the limitations of these platforms. I mean, we, we do need to use them, uh, so to speak, because so many masses of people are using them. Uh, but also, we need to uh, promote and educate others around how these platforms are not just surveilling us, but also suppressing our content. And that makes our work uh, just that much harder. So I'm hoping over the course of the months, the days, months, years to come that we will be organizing also alternative ways to get our information out uh, to the masses of people, um, as well as using these platforms. We don't have to do one or the other. And then on the other uh, point I want to make is that a lot of the new cold work in China is about technology and is about high tech uh, development and how China is moving uh, way forward in this realm, not just in 5G technology, but in uh, GPS systems, etc. And uh, it is important to oppose uh, that because um, the United States really wants to maintain its hegemony over technology. So it can continue to surveil masses of people all over the world so that it can maintain this control, however profitable it is. It's also about maintaining social control. So uh, we need to ensure that this so-called tech war that's being uh, waged by the United States is uh, battled against because uh, I think it, it plays a huge role in undermining the hegemony that the United States has to do what it does through these platforms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, if, unless anyone else wants to respond. The next uh, question is about Libya. Um, and the question is directed at uh, Afyong. Um, that, I'm a little unclear about the question, but you can answer Afyong. Um, uh, the person is asking uh, if AFRICOM was the first to strike Libya by firing some 100 missiles. 
And this followed a UN resolution way before NATO forces struck and destroyed the country. Is this compatible with their so-called mission of peace, security, and development? Should Libya and Africa in general be asking for reparations when a decolonized leadership gets to power? Okay. Um, thank you. I'm sure, you know, uh, my brother um, Aziz would also want to come in on that. Great. Um, but just to say, in terms of Libya, um, I don't think it was Africa, well, at least not openly, it was NATO yes, that yes. struck the missiles, and I stand to be corrected. But obviously, you know, Africa would have been part of the underground, um, you know, surveillance and facilitation. And of course, you remember, forgotten the name of the American ambassador there, the young guy who, you know, um, was also assassinated, you know, uh, after Gaddafi. He was, an, he was the American ambassador. Um, you know, so obviously Gaddafi's spirit must have reached back, you know, from the far beyond to also pull him in. That's the one, I've forgotten his name, is the one that, um, what's her name, Hillary Clinton is being grilled on. But I'm just saying, you know, that it was NATO that, you know, facilitated openly the, the missiles and the attack on um, Libya. Now, on the question of uh, reparations for what they've done, it won't even just be Libya. It's it's about all of us, you know. We, you know, the, the, the question of uh, reparations for... Uh, and for slavery, uh, reparations for colonialism, absolutely. But reparations can only be gotten by victorious people. You know, so our quest for reparations is itself going to have to be a fight for our liberation. You know, because we're not going to get reparations on bended knee. You know, we have to be clear about that. And so the point is, you know, even generally as we're discussing now, um, I'm sure we're discussing, you know, to use this information as a, you know, as a fighting weapon, you know, to use the information, you know, as, as power, as leverage, you know, as um, instruments, you know, for resistance. So that's going to be what it it's, will happen in Libya. And of course, the question of Libya has impacted the rest <sighs> of the continent, especially the south, uh, the western part of the continent, you know. Um, it's going to be nine years, I think. Uh, very soon, um, actually in a month's time, uh, nine years of um, the assassination of Gaddafi. And um, I'm planning to, you know, do some work to have a program on that specifically, you know, and we'll let all, you know, our partners, you know, get information on that before that time. So, yes, the, the, the we would have to, it would be a battle for our liberation, you know, um, and not just the question of reparations. And the last point I want to make is that this whole struggle against Africa and all these other imperialist agencies is going to have to be, you know, um, located or conceptualized within the framework of the defeat of neocolonialism. Because if we do not also struggle to defeat neocolonialism on the continent, then, you know, we will just be going around in circles, you know, because like I said, you know, our the, the ruling class is 500% compromised, you know, as we speak today. Um, so let me stop there. I don't know if, um, you know, Aziz wanted to... Just um, quickly to, to complete. Actually, it's, it's AFRICOM who started this thing. It was on March 19, 2011. AFRICOM launched the operation Odyssey Down. That was the first phase of the war to overthrow the government in Tripoli, which was completed by France, and France had armed most of the opponents. Uh, the sinister result is the dislocation of Libya, and the model that is spreading is called Sahelistan. And this activism of France, uh, and now Russia, Turkey, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the Emirates, um, and then you have jihadist forces, uh, Syrian mercenaries, Libyan tribes, you have Sudanese, you have Chadian ethnic militia groups, and all kind of trafficking, uh, mushrooming in that area. Uh, and this Sahelistan model had spread in Mali, in Burkina Faso, part of Nigeria, and dislocating the sub-region. And even we have um, effects until you reach uh, Mozambique today. So this is a, a, a something, a Pandora box that was certainly uh, created by AFRICOM. Thank you, thank you so much. And we're, we're winding down. We only have a few minutes uh, left. Um, and uh, 
Uh, the last question we're going to have here is about Israel. Uh, for any of our panelists who want to answer, what role does Israel play in U.S. policy in Africa and how are its own interests expressed? Do any of our panelists want to answer that question? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I didn't get that. Yes, what role does Israel play in U.S. policy in Africa and how are its own interests expressed? Uh, it's, it's a very discreet uh, role that Israel is playing. You would find them mainly in um, uh, surveillance and, uh, you know, um, like manics around the head of states, Comprador states. So they, they highly specialize in surveillance and, uh, uh, you know, coping the CIA agents and completing their work. Uh, on very strategic ways. Most of these head of states who rely on this intelligence, uh, like uh, in, in Cameroon, for example. So they're kind of active and uh, their role is really in the shade and shadow, but they follow American policies very blindly and work together. Uh, in the Horn of Africa, in Central Africa, they're very active. And we know that they have been active uh, in the continent for years. You know, they have assassinated uh, PLO uh, 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 leaders in, in Tunis, for example. So uh, they never hesitate if their interest is in jeopardy to intervene. But I must say they have a more discreet role. But now that you have Turkey and other countries involved, uh, they are quite active, but it's very... Um, hidden. Very good. Thank you. And I just want to add um, uh, just a reminder that uh, Black Alliance for Peace calls for the demilitari demilitarization of Africa and for Africa to be a zone of peace. That is our position. It's the anti-imperialist position, of course. So we are, um, we're winding down. Um, thank you all so much. I want to repeat my thanks uh, to our panelists, Aziz Fall, Danny Haifong, Bama Nazad, and Afiang El Afiang. Thank you all so much. I want to thank our interpreters as well. Um, it's, um, it's a great feeling to know that we are reaching people all over, uh, all over the world. So it's very important that we have this interpretation. I thank them. Uh, our whole Black Alliance for Peace team, our um, coordinating committee, our national organizer, Ajamu Baraka, everyone who uh, uh, assisted us today, uh, Tunde, it's, all, it's terrible when you start naming people, then you leave people out, Tunde Ozazua, uh, other folks behind the scenes, Netfa Freeman, Shade Swift, um, and I think our interpreters only have their first names, Seydou, Osman, Kwame, and Placid, uh, and uh, 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 Julie Varaghese also, who's always helping us. So um, thank you, thank you all so much. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure to, uh, to host this event. Um, Black Alliance for Peace, please follow us if you have not uh, gone to our website, blackallianceforpeace.com. We're on Twitter, Blacks for Peace. That's the number four, Blacks number four peace. And follow us there. Follow us on Facebook uh, and on Instagram as well. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.